Good, good afternoon uh, and welcome to our virtual town hall focused on health and safety. Uh, my name is Jesse Bernal and I serve as Grand Valley's Vice President for Inclusion, Equity and Presidential Initiatives and I will continue to help um, as I have before moderating today's town hall. This is a continued commitment by the University and President Mantella to engage with the campus community as often as possible and to provide as much information as possible as we approach the beginning of the fall semester. We are so pleased uh, to be joined by over nearly a thousand faculty and staff who have registered to join us this afternoon. As you can imagine, we've received hundreds of questions, in fact, nearly 450 questions. We've attempted to group those questions into themes and we'll answer the most pressing questions during our time together. For those who have individual or specific questions that weren't answered today, you will have an opportunity to submit follow-up questions after the town hall. Given the number of attendees and the number of questions, uh, we will not be taking live questions today, but we'll provide lots of information through the chat, chat function. I want to begin by introducing our panelists uh, and first introducing our president, President Philomena Mantella. Dr. Maria Cimitelli, our provost and executive vice president for academic and student affairs. Dr. Greg Saniel, our vice president for finance and administration and treasurer to the board. Dr. Etta Bufidel, our associate vice president for academic affairs. We're also joined today by a number of health and science and wellness experts. We are so grateful for their time and their leadership as we have um, considered the many factors as we plan for repopulation this fall. Uh, let me begin with Dr. Jean Nichol Clerk, our vice provost for, for health. Tina Bar Barnikow, our Senior Director for Health and also in the Office of the Vice Provost for Health. Lindsay De Desarmo, our Wellness and Communications Manager in Human Resources. Professor Doug Graham from Biomedical Sciences. Professor Graham has a PhD in Biomedical uh, Microbiology from Colorado State University. And before coming to Grand Valley, Dr. Graham was a postdoctoral fellow, a research fellow in the Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention and the University of Notre Dame. He's the author of 17 publications and his research interests include molecular ecology of infectious disease agents and their hosts. He's also a member of the American Society for Parasitologists. I'd also like to welcome and, and really say thank you for being here today to Dr. Caroline Beal. Dr. Beal is uh, our Metro Health Campus Health Center physician. Dr. Beal is board certified in family medicine and sports medicine and is a team physician for Grand Valley State University, the Grand Rapids Griffins, U.S. figure skating, among, among other local sporting events. Dina Aper also joins us. Dina is a senior infection preventionist from Metro Health. Dean is certified by the American Society of Clinical Pathologists as a medical laboratory scientist and by the American, uh, by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology as an infection control practitioner. With almost two decades of healthcare experience, she is currently a senior infection pre preventionist at Metro Health Hospital, where she and her teammates have been working tirelessly since January to develop recommendations based in sound science, CDC guidance, and common sense to the COVID-19 response. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bill um, to give some opening comments on the state of the virus and how organizations are responding to daily changing conditions. Dr. Bill. Thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me to your town hall. Um, I've been asked to give an update on what we know right now about SARS-CoV-2 and how to mitigate risk as best we can. Um, the CDC and other public health organizations have been vigorously compiling data um, from the most up-to-date studies, which means guidelines change as new information comes in. And because there is that constant stream of information from research being done, I've also asked Dina, our senior infection preventionist, to join me today. Um, as you just mentioned, she's been working like crazy to find all that most up-to-date um, information. She's been helping to lead our organization through this pandemic and I personally have been <laughs> leaning on her for basically all things COVID. So, um, so really during this pandemic what we're trying to do is slow the spread and prevent the spread to our vulnerable populations. Um, there's several things that we can do to accomplish these goals. Um, first and foremost, 
probably the single most important thing we can all do is to physically distance. Um, viruses mainly spread through droplets from one person's mouth and nose to another person's mouth and nose. <laughs> so it's these droplets that carry the virus and they have to land in someone else's respiratory tract to then cause infection. Um, so allowing that six feet decreases the chance that a droplet ever makes it to another person's airway um, since it will drop to the ground pretty quickly. Um, droplets typically fall within three feet. So if you add your three feet, it's my three feet, we get our six feet of distancing. Um, when that physical distancing isn't possible, the next best thing we can do is to wear a face covering or a cloth mask. Um, it's important that the cloth mask covers your nose and mouth, otherwise it isn't really doing very much. Um, and when two people that are within close contact, which is defined by the CDC as um, less than six feet for 15 minutes, that risk of spread is significantly decreased with at least one study showing a 1.5% transmission rate um, under these circumstances. So another important thing uh, or method to mitigate the risk of spread, of course, is frequent hand washing. Avoid touching your nose, your face, your mouth, and um, also using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer when soap and water aren't readily available. Um, cleaning and disinfecting high-touch surfaces frequently um, and with approved products uh, is of course, really important too, but there's specific ways that we have to use those products for them to work. Um, so we have to adhere to the product's dwell time, which is how long that product, that chemical needs to stay in contact with the virus in order to kill it. Um, so it, it needs to be wet for that full time. And sometimes that's 10 minutes and that's a long time um, that, that these products need to be in contact. So it's not just like a quick, quick wipe. Um, another thing that we can be doing is um, self-assessments. So really all that is is a check-in with yourself every day, beginning of the day, before you, know, you set foot into the workplace or any public space um, to review the potential symptoms um, of COVID-19 and confirm you don't have any. Um, you know, going down the list one by one, no, I don't have this, no, I don't have this, okay, I'm, I'm good to go. I've seen many patients now that um, after the fact, they say, oh yeah, I had a, a sore throat, I didn't think anything of it, um, or I had a mild congestion, and three days later, lost my sense of taste and smell, which is kind of that cardinal symptom we keep seeing, and then they get tested, lo and behold, they have COVID-19. Well, for the three days prior, when they had the sore throat, they were still out and about doing everything. So, um, you know, those, I think all of those things combined together um, really just helps protect all of us, um, protects you, protects me <laughs> um, against that spread. Um, so that's all I have for you, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beal. Really appreciate your insight and all the work that you've been doing. I'm grateful for that. Um, we are definitely going to get to some of the details that Dr. Beal has, has outlined. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss more in depth our safety measures, the use of face covering, self-assessments, and more. And before we get to some of your specific questions, I'd like to welcome President Mantella for some comments. Thank you, Jesse. And thanks to the other panelists, Dr. Beal, thank you for being here. I uh, appreciate everybody has been working 24-7 on our shared interest to both have a safe a community as we can have to be sure that we're getting the best guidance and following the best guidance and to provide um, a strong and vital and vi uh, viable student experience for our students. Um, I, I want to first kind of begin by acknowledging the uncertainty, acknowledging the fear and acknowledging the fact that other conditions change around us each and every day. So this is a different kind of planning exercise in that as we prepare, um, we have to continue to prepare. We have to move from thinking about this as an incident that we're dealing with 
uh, and think about it as a condition that we have to live with over a period of time and how to best manage the circumstances around us. Obviously, this is a global pandemic. There's nowhere to go that changes the circumstances of the conditions around us. So what we, we, what we need to do and um, what we're working very hard to do is to uh, be sure that our community is taking all of the precautions that will allow us to be as safe a community as we can possibly be. Um, I want to also acknowledge that we don't have all the answers today because it is an ongoing uh, planning exercise for us. We do have quite a few. We've been working very hard, as I said. We have ownership assigned to many, many areas of responsibility. Many of the people that you see on this call today are leading teams with much more dedicated time from community members um, in order to get ready for the fall and to work through the fall and perhaps even the winter in the condition that is um, where we're living with the COVID-19 virus. Safety is top of our mind, um, absolute top of our mind for our faculty, for our staff, for our students, and for our impact on other communities uh, in which we coexist, in which our hospitals must be ready for any spikes uh, and any conditions that are created by any community member. So we're very, very mindful of this very broad ecosystem. Um, I want to remind us all that there's no one person that can make this uh, community safe. It doesn't matter who we are, and I think we all, we all recognize that, that this is a shared responsibility. We've heard many times, but we can't say it enough that everyone must do their part. And the, that leadership needs to not only set the tone, we need to act on the expectations we set in our community. Um, and that action is on education, it's on de-escalation, it's on enforcement, it's on reinforcement. So we're working on the, all of those things. We must model the behavior and we must monitor it closely so we understand the conditions and when we need to pivot and when and how we need to adjust. And we have to be prepared for those various scenarios. That's not just leadership, that really has manifested in everyone's work. Faculty have worked incredibly hard to be able to adjust to a multimodality teaching um, approach and to be able to adjust if necessary from one to the other. Um, in our, our areas that support Students, um, we're looking at many ways, virtually, intimate groups, hybrid, uh, to deliver our uh, support and to create community and to create engagement that is safe and um, responsible. I can't promise you that there will, we will be virus free. I can't promise you 100% um, compliance but I can promise you absolute vigilance. I can promise you that we are securing, seeking and achieving to bring some of the best counsel to GVSU around these conditions. I can promise you that we're looking at the full set of considerations that Jesse will put up shortly. I can promise you that we're making good decisions. I can promise you that we are taking stock of the need for ongoing monitoring in this virus and we're assembling a dedicated team who will work day and night in order to be sure we're getting our key indicators of what's happening in on a daily basis, we're adjusting as necessary, we're making good decisions, we're keeping leadership informed, uh, we're keeping our community informed, uh, we're uh, acting on our obligations to let people know who are in contact with the obligation to protect privacy. All of those conditions are being considered. So um, what we're going to do today is really talk about, thank you, Jesse, we're going to talk about the um, progress made to date. This is a picture of all of the various elements that we are working on. Athletics is a good example. We have a meeting with our conference tomorrow. 
uh, because uh, the conversations about competition or shifting the schedules as some conferences has done or late starts, postponements, cancellations have to be taken together as a conference. So that's an example of where it's uh, in the works, but we do not have a specific answer yet um, for our plan for the fall. All of these are being worked on individually, but they're all, this picture would be better if it was a network. It was a system that was one thing was connected to one another because what we do in terms of getting full compliance on health self-assessments self and people not to come to campus when they're symptomatic will help us in our containment strategy, our outbreaks, uh, and all of the things that will ultimately keep us a safe community. So there's lots of progress along these lines. Uh, we're using a format because of the detail and because of the number of questions that were submitted. Thank you so much for doing that to try to take you through a few, just a few PowerPoint slides to give you the overview of where we're at and what we have remaining. We understand the critical path of the work to be done and we're working hard on it. So um, with that, let me turn to uh, Greg Saniel, who's going to begin to connect the dots on some of this work. I think that's our next uh, speaker. Thank you, President Mantella. As President Mantella said, we're, we're evolving from the IMT and the TAG, the incident management team, and the technical advisory group into a full-time task force that will provide monitoring of our response to the virus uh, as we move into the fall. The makeup of that team is still being developed, but what we're, we've brought in the Boston Consulting Group to help us with best in breed and uh, processes and ideas to develop what we're calling the, our health and safety ecosystem. And what that is, is it, it's the 4T IQ. And what is that? Well, that's testing, tracking, tracing, technology, isolation, and quarantine. And we're working on all those projects simultaneously, and eventually that will be knitted together in time for the fall uh, so that we're ready for a reopening process. For instance, we're looking at a testing regimen that will include not just people who are symptomatic and providing uh, the, the process for that person to be tested, but also looking at regular testing of high risk groups looking at surveillance testing so that we have an understanding, you know, random surveillance testing so we have an understanding of, of where the virus may or may not be in our community. We will have the technology that will knit all that together so that we can then identify potential hotspots, maybe in a, in, a, in a living center, maybe a floor of a living center, maybe in a classroom. Um, we'll be able to identify that with the technology and the analytics so we can take appropriate action. With, through our tracking systems, uh, we have isolation areas that are being set up in our living centers. We have 60 beds that will be for isolation of, of students. Um, we'll have a, a tracing mechanism in place. Um, we will have all this together. This will be monitored by this team. This will uh, be a small team of experts. Membership is still evolving. And so that we will be ready to reopen and operate this campus with the best available uh, monitoring processes in place will be linked directly with uh, testing labs with the local health departments and understanding and communicating uh, daily dashboards so we will be ready to go um, with this process with all these uh, structures in place and, and properly uh, brought together so that we can have that health informed face-to-face -face campus experience that we're looking to have in the fall. Thanks, Greg. Uh, the care for our community well-being is our top priority. Um, we received many, many questions about how the university is supporting the well-being, the mental health of our employees. So we want to take a moment to be sure everyone understands the support that is available for all of you. Um, so I'm going to ask Lindsay to, to share with us what are the supports we are providing for employee mental health and well-being? Thank you, Jesse. You could, uh, perfect. Um, so 
My role in human resources of overseeing our wellness program, um, which includes our work life and mental health resources and support. So on the slide here, um, as President Mantel uh, referred to how we want to best manage the circumstances and the conditions around us that, that takes a lot to do so. And so our team and human resources has been working um, to provide some updated and uh, repackaged content. So we've, we've had a number of resources available for our faculty and staff for um, some time, but with our given current circumstances, we've retweaked and repackaged um, some tools for you um, that we'd like you to um, take a look at and, and find what works best for you, understanding that right now we know everybody's going through such a unique experience that there's no one size fits all. So on the screen here, um, the, the links, this link to the slides will be shared after the presentation today. Um, but the highlights I want to call out uh, are the seven free counseling sessions that we all have access to via Encompass All One EAP. So anytime you or your family members have access to that. Um, you also have access to wellness coaching uh, through the Thrive at GVSU program uh, during open enrollment in the fall. So a couple of those uh, resources as well. Uh, I want to highlight Elisa Salazar, who is our work life consultant. Uh, she is available to help triage. So you're not quite sure where to go or where to start. Something's not right or we want to you want to brainstorm. Um, she's available and not just for individual, um, but again, um, supervisors looking to consult um, with with employees as well and working with the HR team, um, Deb Sanders and her side of the house as well. So there are a number of resources for emotional wellness, physical wellness we know um, impacts our emotional well-being. Um, an example of how we've kind of re configured for the current situation is the kindness cards. Uh, those were uh, paper cards that were sent out uh, to people on campus, just kind notes and thank yous. Uh, we made those virtual. Uh, another area to highlight is uh, transitioning back to work, some emotional considerations. Uh, uh, Maureen um, Walsh is working on a video currently and, and there's some handouts there um, that would be helpful potentially um, to read and go through some things that as we return to the physical workplace, what might we be experiencing? So highlighting those for all of you. Um, and then also wanted to highlight the, um, Jesse, if you want to hit the next slide for the mylifeexpert.com. Um, this is our web portal that's available through Encompass, our EAP. And this is where we do pull a lot of the content that um, you see emails coming out from human resources, a number of the mental health areas. Um, it's coming from uh, this portal it has COVID-19 specific resources as well as social justice um, content and information that uh, might be useful, um, career services, child care, there's, there's a lot there. Um, so if you haven't already created an account through this uh, portal, I would uh, recommend doing so, so that you can access the care that you need. Um, but also uh, connecting with Elisa in our office as well, um, and she can help um, triage and, and connect you with really what works best for you. So again, there's a lot of tools um, out there and for our unique experiences, and hopefully this these are some um, materials that, that could be helpful for you. Thank you, Lindsay, for all of that. Um, and as Lindsay said, we'll send out links to those with a follow-up email as well. So now let's get to some of your, your questions. Um, we receive lots of questions about self-assessment, how that's being handled, as well as the required training for returning to campus. So a couple of weeks ago, you know, the university released an online health self-assessment web form that will require all employees and students to complete each day before arriving to campus or leaving their residence halls. So Tina, um, since you were involved in the creation of this effort, can you tell us more about how employees are being informed about the assessment, how the university is using that information, and what employees should do if they are instructed to stay home. Sure, happy to do so, Jesse. So as Jesse mentioned, um, the initial communication um, was sent to employees a couple of weeks ago and that came out via email. There's also a link on the Lakers Together website um, that not only gives you the link to the assessment, but there's also some information there. There's a, another link that provides the directions for how to set that up as a shortcut on your um, mobile device, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, and then if you log into your mobile device, um, you know, starting today, there's actually a bright yellow icon that will help you um, set that, um, that link or that shortcut up on your mobile device if you want to do that. So those are all um, 
kind of reminders, they're working on putting something on the homepage, um, on the university homepage, that will also be a reminder for people to do the assessment. And then of course, supervisors are always encouraged to remind employees to do that. Um, as new employees are hired, um, human resources will take lead in uh, making sure that new employees are aware of the need to do the self-assessment. And then obviously supervisors can continue to reinforce that as people start. Um, we will continue regular communication about the self-assessments for as long as is needed. Um, we know it's a new thing and so people kind of have to get into this habit. Um, so we'll continue that communication and, and make sure people are aware of the university expectations or any changes that might happen, you know, in the future. Um, you also asked about how the university is using the data and what people should do if they stay home. So the data is maintained in a secure database um, with limited access and will be used as part of the ongoing monitoring process that was referred to by, Doc, um, by President Mantella earlier and help us to identify emerging trends early. Um, that's the real key for us in this and that's that early identification. Um, if somebody it, um, answers yes to one of the questions, it will trigger the message that directs them to stay home. Um, please do so if you get that, that little red circle and that message to stay home. As Dr. Beal noted in her um, opening comments, it's the subtle symptoms that are really, really important for us to pay attention to early because they can be the beginning um, symptoms of, of this COVID virus. And so many of those symptoms are so subtle. It is the congestion, it is the sore throat. Um, it's not this really severe cough and fever that people I think remember from the early spring. It's the more subtle things um, that we're really seeing right now. And then the hallmark of the loss of um, taste or smell that we're seeing particularly in a, in a younger population. So when you have those symptoms, please report them and please stay home when, when you're directed to do so on that self-assessment. Um, those positive self-assessments will get pushed to the health compliance nurses in the Office of the Vice Provost for Health. A nurse will follow up with those um, individuals, um, kind of talk through the situation. And in most cases, if there's been symptoms reported or an exposure, they will be asked to follow up with their provider to facilitate testing. Um, and asked to remain off campus until we get through the process and, and um, confirm whether or not they have COVID or not. Um, employees should stay in touch with their supervisor and then if they're gonna be off for any period of time, we make sure we connect them to human resources so that they're aware of um, any benefits that are available during this time. So as we look to returning in the fall and the fact that we'll have a much higher volume of assessments being completed, we're currently in the process of reviewing proposals with our local health systems to develop um, a much more expanded partnership um, that will help us um, with all of these health, health assessments, the follow-up, the contacts, notifications, and some of the additional work that we know that we'll have ahead of us this fall. Great, thank you, Tina. Uh, so we've also received dozens of questions about how the campus will handle testing, as well as the kinds of data and metrics we're monitoring as we plan to repopulate the campus and what we'll track as we are repopulated to make decisions about any changes we should make in our learning or working plan. So Dr. Nagel Clerk, uh, you, can you explain, expand on what Tina began and Greg also began on the university's in-depth research and investigation of possible options as we get close to the beginning of the fall semester since you've been leading that effort? Thank you, Jesse, yes. Um, and it's not, not just my effort, but a group of individuals have been researching the published guidelines and the scientific literature. We've been consulting with infectious disease physicians and other medical experts in the area of the testing, tracing, and trigger identification and response. Based on Grand Valley community needs, we are developing a comprehensive university plan to implement appropriate actions in each of these three areas. And I'd like to take a moment to discuss each. First, in the area of testing, as Greg alluded, our plan will include a strategy for a repopulation of our campus we will engage in surveillance and high risk group testing, as well as what we're currently doing, the symptomatic and exposure testing will continue. We plan to have capabilities of on-site campus testing, as well as what we're already doing at the Campus Health Center. 
And we will also be working closely with our partners to make sure that once we collect a specimen, that we get timely results so that individual can get the best care possible and that we can mitigate future spread. As far as tracing going, we are working very closely with each of the local health departments. In addition, we've contacted the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, spoke to them and discussed a coordinated plan for comprehensive tracing and tracking. And I will let, Tina's gonna talk about that a little later so I won't go any further, but we're doing a robust area for that so that we can keep on top of it. And again, mitigating risk. In the area of triggers or what do we do if something happens, we are working with our healthcare partners with expertise in infectious disease. To develop, we already have developed some protocols which they've reviewed, but develop even more protocols to guide us on those potential triggers and then making rapid decisions to keep our community safe. Um, daily, as Tina mentioned, we will be reviewing and monitoring the self-help assessment data. We will be looking at any positive cases that come in, whether they're single, making certain decisions based on that, and more importantly, maybe cluster decisions. We have a cluster of COVID cases. In addition, we'll be making that a 360 round with what's happening in our community, and we'll be communicating with all the healthcare organizations and the health departments, a minimum of weekly, if not daily. So let's say that we do get a COVID cluster and we see this little pop up. Let's say it happens to be in an in-person classroom. We would immediately notify those individuals and we would remove, we would move that in-person class remotely for a specific period of time. And then they would remove, go back to in-person class. This would help us mitigate risk and keep them safe and others as well. I am especially pleased to share with you today that President Mantella is investing heavily in the safety and wellness of our community and providing the appropriate resources that we need to do a reopening and to be as safe as we can. Grand Valley will be engaging in a partnership with local healthcare organizations to provide regular consultation with infectious disease doctors and infectious preventive preventionists, as well as have a 24 hour, seven day a week call and COVID resource center for our community. We will also be working with them seamlessly for our self-health assessments where they can contact the individuals, not immediately, but within a couple hours to make sure that those individuals get the appropriate care and that we're able to make strategic decisions for our university. We will continue to work with them for protocol development. And as we know, the science of the virus is emerging. We will develop new protocols with their expertise and with our expertise within our own community. And we will implement them quickly. We will also coordinate with them and they with the health departments and the state health department, any contact tracing efforts that we need. So as you can see, we have been intensely planning and coordinating our health effort and we'll be hoping to mitigate as much spread if we have any and keep our campuses safe. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. I, I would just wanna add, just so uh, the folks on here know that we're, we're not naming our specific partners for these elements because Jean is leading the effort to review the RFIs in real time today. So that is something that we'll be able to share with our community as we complete that effort. But she very articulately went through the capabilities we're searching for and uh, that we need to assure are available to us. So thank you, Jean. You're welcome. Thanks, President Mantella. Uh, Provost Chimantilla, you know, we received many questions about the, the likelihood and possibility of positive cases and in particular as they might impact faculty, student, academic continuity. Can you share some of the contingency plans and how faculty should handle these situations when a student may get sick or they may get sick themselves? Yes, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for being here and taking time for this. I'm really happy we have health experts on the call. 
Um, I know every one of us has questions and figuring out what the fall is going to look like and how we're going to handle things. So the situation that Dr. Bernal brought up with regard to what if a student um, has to self-quarantine on the one hand or what if a student becomes ill, and those are two different situations. For the student who has to self-quarantine, uh, we will be asking faculty to make accommodations to you know, have online assignments for that student so the student doesn't have to be in the, re the rest of the population. Um, and our, all of our faculty do that regularly in normal circumstances. Um, for the student who becomes ill, um, there are some, just our general policies we'll be putting in place, our, our, excuse me, our regular policies are in place to deal with that, either a, um, a incomplete, a medical withdrawal, or a late withdrawal, uh, we're extending the deadlines, we hope, uh, with that. Um, so all of those things are available for faculty at their disposal. As, as Dr. Nagelkirk mentioned before, if a, if a student tests positive in the classroom, we will immediately take action in the way that, that she recounted. So we are planning, my office of course is planning and, and putting more and um, new information up on our website as we speak. So that's a very good location. If you have questions, go to the provost office website. It will either give you the answers or link you to the area of the answers. Great. Thank you, Provost Chimitelli. Uh, Tina, uh, just a little bit more detail on the contact tracing since we received questions. I know we're taking a, a, a care-based approach to this. Some of our faculty are curious about what the isolation and quarantine will look like. Uh, will they be notified if their students are, are test positive? Um, so if you can share a little bit more about how we're sort of both the process and then how we're kind of scaling up as we repopulate the campus. Sure. So, you know, if a student um, test positive, first and foremost, we want to make sure that they have the care that they need. So if they're an on-campus student, we have rooms that are already set aside for isolation on campus. So we would move them to one of those rooms. Um, we also coordinate dining and other services that they may need while they're um, in isolation. Um, and then for our off-campus students, um, we have a variety of resources that we're putting together for them so that they also know how to safely self-isolate um, in their environment if that's what they choose to do. Um, some students may choose to go home. Um, some students may choose to stay on campus. So we want to support them in whatever decision they make. Um, student Affairs will also work with students to make sure that they're connected to faculty and that they get the support that they need for their academic work. Um, so that the services that are available that the provost just talked about, um, students are aware of that and, and, and can make sure that they've got all those connections made. Um, and then, you know, obviously the next piece is around communication. So whether it's an employee that tests positive or a student that tests positive, we will work with them to make sure we identify those contacts as quickly as we can and kind of start um, what we call contact tracing. And then we will make those notices as appropriate. So um, we will notify um, faculty um, as appropriate. We will notify um, supervisors um, and, and make sure that they know what the situation is. And we will also identify if they've had close contacts within that area, whether those cl close contacts may need to quarantine. Um, and then we keep referring to contact tracing. And contact tracing is um, technically the under the accountability and the um, responsibility of the local health departments. And we're really fortunate in that we have great relationships with both Kent and Ottawa County. They have been um, kind of part of a lot of our meetings since March, really, um, or actually earlier than that. Um, so um, as we look at what we need for contact tracing, we've been in conversations with them and we're looking at um, how we can support them to continue their work. So we don't want to take it over from them, but we want to support them. So we're looking at the ability to um, put in some additional resources so that if we do have um, an outbreak or um, as Dr. Nagelkirk referred to, a, a cluster that we may need to do a lot of contact tracing on, that we can help provide some resources for them so that they can get, so that that contact tracing can be done quickly. And the reason it's so important that it's done quickly is the sooner we can identify potential cases and get them into quarantine, the less spread that we're likely to have. And so um, it's why this whole piece of you know, the early identification, the um, early contact tracing and the early testing 
um, all kind of fits together um, to reduce the spread and um, hopefully keep things moving. Thanks, Tina. So we, we've received lots of questions about face coverings and community, community expectations. Uh, Professor Bufidel, uh, several participants have questions about the university's policy on face covering since it recently changed uh, with the state's current executive order. Can you briefly uh, be specific about our current policy and requirements and what guidance can you provide faculty and staff who may encounter a student not wearing a mask or face covering or a colleague who may need reminding to wear it more often than, than, than not? Thank you, Vice President Burnett. Um, I've got something to share here. The, um, so to, to kind of get us up this, to remind us the, uh, of uh, the, the, the timetable here, about a month ago, uh, we published our initial face covering policy um, after feedback from the Grand Valley community and the new executive orders from Governor Whitmer, uh, the policy was revised on July 14th. Uh, there was also a minor revision yesterday. Um, let's look at the policy. Um, it's on the Lakers Together site. And uh, the key part is right here that face coverings that cover the mouth and nose are required indoors. Face cover coverings are required outdoors when social distancing is not possible. Um, so by indoors, we include classrooms, hallways, restrooms, elevators, and so on. Uh, we have uh, a couple exceptions here, uh, but not many. Um, and uh, this is written in a way that I think is clear and, and, and can be explained uh, to, to others. Um, Professor Graham, Doug, uh, can you talk a bit about the science behind the importance of face coverings? Uh, sure. So just to piggyback on what Dr. Beal uh, shared with us in the beginning, we're, uh, we're dealing, of course, with a respiratory virus and therefore um, transmission is via uh, both droplets and aerosols that, that are generated from uh, coughing, sneezing, speaking, singing. Uh, and there have been a number of lab studies with uh, influenza virus and the common cold viruses, which are perfectly reasonable proxies in this particular instance, um, showing that mask, uh, wearing a mask significantly reduces the spread of, of both droplets uh, and aerosols. And there's epidemiological data that also supports this using uh, COVID-19 actually. And if you compare COVID-19 uh, growth rates uh, before and after mask mandates in a number of US states, there's a noticeable decrease in uh, COVID-19 incidents, and it became even more apparent with time. Uh, but most significantly, and, and this is why uh, the CDC changed its guidance on mask wearing uh, once this was discovered, is that with this virus, both pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission is possible. We can't tell who's infected, uh, including ourselves in some cases. Uh, you can't look in a crowd and say, ah, that person needs to be wearing a mask. Uh, so given this fact, uh, reason and, and logic would dictate that uh, if we want to reduce the spread, the incidence of COVID-19, that as many people as possible uh, wear face coverings. Thank you, Professor Graham. Um, there's also, there have been a lot of concerns that how we'll ensure compliance for this requirement. We heard those concerns from faculty and staff and from students and parents. Um, compliance was a key discussion item in the focus groups that we held in June. Our main approach to compliance is gonna to be to educate and deescalate. Um, that's, how, that's, that's what we wanna do here. And uh, yesterday, the Human Resources published a new face coverings compliance protocol. Um, it's both a web page that you can see here and there's a one page PDF flyer uh, that's available. In the protocol, we have four steps. Uh, one is care and curiosity, uh, then educate, remedy, and lastly, if necessary, to report. Um, to go really briefly through this, care and curiosity is, is uh, to be kind, give reminders and say, uh, do, do you have your mask? Um, and many times people will and they just had forgotten to put it on. Um, asking questions out of curiosity. Um, educate, um, you, you can direct employees or students to uh, the toolkit, which I'll show you in a moment if you're not familiar with it. There, there's a lot of information there. Um, there are educational responses. Um, perhaps people are not aware of our policy. Perhaps people um, are 
don't understand uh, all the science behind it. Um, and we have different suggestions there for that. Uh, for remedies, we will have disposable face coverings available in offices that uh, you can send uh, students down to, for instance, uh, to pick one up. Um, and students could be asked to leave a, a, a classroom or, or a building if necessary. Um, employees uh, can, who, who continue to not wear face coverings may be asked to go home. Uh, we have reporting options uh, through for students through our conflict uh, conduct and conflict resolution. Uh, for employees, we have uh, in, we have disciplinary action, um, and we also have anonymous reporting that can happen. Um, so all these are possibilities in terms of the face covering uh, uh, compliance protocol. Now I mentioned the toolkit um, that was created uh, in early July uh, to provide a lot of educational information uh, for uh, for everyone. Uh, we need to educate ourselves so we can educate others, particularly students. Uh, you can see the, um, the different um, options here on the site. Um, and very quickly, we have uh, some videos that you can show in class uh, that are not very long, that are very uh, informative. There's a whole section on compliance in the classroom. Uh, there's suggested syllabus language, um, teaching with face coverings and social distancing, a lot of FAQs down here. All this information is available publicly, uh, so it's not just for us, it's for students and parents to see it too. We want to be transparent about how we are, are, are addressing this issue, and they're as interested as we are. Um, one final point uh, when it comes to enforcement of face coverings, uh, we see the worst cases in the media. Uh, so let's be clear, if a conflict arises and you feel unsafe, please remove yourself from the situation and seek appropriate support. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Um, Dr. Saniel, so, so lots of questions about sanitation and cleaning, particularly around protocols for air quality, uh, social distancing in elevators, the cleaning of classrooms, and how we'll work to sanitize spaces if uh, someone who occupied that space tests positive. Can you share more about the university's process in those areas? Uh, sure thing, Jesse. The, um, as far as uh, air quality in the buildings, uh, we have very modern buildings, very modern HVAC systems. Uh, so we'll be uh, using those systems to increase air exchange, more outside air will be introduced to the buildings. Uh, we'll cycle the air more frequently, increase filter changes, things like that. These are all recommendations for the American Society for Heating and, and Air Conditioning Engineers that we'll be following to ensure the best air quality we can inside our buildings. As far as um, sanitation in the classrooms, the classrooms will be sanitized uh, each day. Uh, disinfectant wipes and disinfecting spray will be available uh, for use throughout the day. Additionally, 80% of our custodial staff is gonna be working between the hours of 4.30 and 9 p.m. just for the reason that they'll be available uh, to respond to um, any issues, uh, be constantly wiping touch points and, and cleaning restrooms and common spaces just as frequently as they can. As far as uh, if somebody tests positive, um, we then, we have a contractor that we will bring in. They use a combination of wiping all touch points and fogging all spaces where the infected individual spent some time. You know, for, for instance, if, some, if somebody worked in, uh, in their office, they would start at the entry point of the building and proceed to the individual space, including elevators and restrooms on the floor, just to be sure. And they use hazmat suits and respirators uh, with their light, because they're specially licensed and certified to do this. Uh, those are things that we don't have the capacity or capability on our custodial staff. So that's what we would do if somebody tested positive. We would, we would, you know, we would make sure that we clean the area. As far as uh, elevators, uh, you know, all of our buildings are you know, no more, except for the Eberhard Center, are only, you know, three, four, five floors. Um, and as far as contact tracing, as long as everybody's wearing a mask, unless you've been in contact, uh, close proximity, uh, for instance, in an elevator with someone for more than 15 minutes, you wouldn't even consider that person somebody that you would need to trace. Um, so, but again, the elevators would just be like the rest of the buildings in a, in the sense that they will be just constantly, the, like I said, 80% of our custodial staff, they'll be out there keeping those touch points, common areas, elevator buttons, all those kinds of things, they'll be constantly uh, working to keep them clean. Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, Provost Chimantelli, we had several questions about uh, that, noting that some universities have shifted their fall calendars, either starting late or ending early, canceling breaks. Can you comment on our current thinking and approach in this area? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you know, we did consider that option. And one of the reasons we decided not to go in that direction was because we don't really know what's going to happen with the virus. Um, as, you, as we all know, it seemed like things were kind of going on a downward slope and now they're not. So we can't predict when or if a virus is going to, to hit us. And so those institutions that change their calendars are taking a bet, frankly, uh, and it may be um, that it doesn't pan out. So we thought we'll just uh, go ahead with our own calendar um, in that you know, it's, it's consistent. If we do have a problem, of course, we will we'll change course. Um, and on that note, I also ask all of the deans to be sure that faculty are prepared in the event that we have to go remote again through the governor's orders, um, that we are prepared with our online pedagogy um, and that we can take the challenge in a way that is a little bit less disruptive than what we saw in, in March. Thanks, uh, Maria. Another question for you. Um, many of our faculty and staff are curious about how we're ensuring that students follow health and safety guidance mm -hmm. and behaviors when they're off campus. Can you talk a little bit about our efforts in that area? Yes. So our uh, housing area works very closely with off-campus apartments and they have a meeting coming up and it actually may have been today if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, where they go through some of the concerns that we have as an institution and they're good partners with us. And so try to help them understand the safety of our community. And, it, and frankly, it's in their best interest to have the safety of the students in their areas so that we can all continue um, to you know, make life as, as normal as possible. In addition to those conversations, Dean Rollman, our Vice Provost for Student Affairs, has been working with a group of students for the educational part of what uh, Dr. Bufidel was talking about, educate our community such that our student body will help other students understand the need to wear masks, to social distance, to monitor their, their symptoms in the way that our health experts were talking about earlier. So we do have a, a very robust educational program that will be um, um, laid out at the beginning of the semester. Thank you, Professor Chimitelli. Um, so just a reminder to everyone um, that we will be sending a follow-up email summarizing this conversation, answering some of the questions we weren't able to get to, uh, and a, a recording of this video and an email where you can respond if you have additional questions. Um, and as we close, I'm going to turn it over to President Mantella for some final remarks. And also a question that many of you have asked is, how are we capturing input from students and what are students saying about uh, returning to campus? So President Mantella? Thank you, and I'll start there, Jesse. Um, one of the pieces of our plan is to do frequent, what we're calling pulse checking, because we want the um, surveys to be short. We want them to be to the point. We want to have a core of questions that we ask each and every time so we can watch the trends. And um, obviously the things that are responding to the situation of the moment. So that's a very important part of our plan. Um, to date, we, we have the last Pulse survey that we did, and we're going to share these uh, through GDNEC so that our full community gets a sense of where we're at, not only in terms of the student population, but the faculty and staff, many of you who are on this uh, Zoom with us now, and how that, um, your feeling, and how those feelings represent the whole, and how we continue to focus on the issues on your mind, on our mind, and strengthen our preparation and strengthen our readiness. So, you know, as of the last Pulse survey that was done last week, about 75% of our students are confident in returning to the fall semester. They report themselves as confident. About 90% of our students want a combination of if fully in person or a mix of in-person and online. Um, we obviously have a percent that are want to be fully online and we're supporting them as well. And each and every day, I would give you an example. I had two student and parent calls today. One was this, a student who really wanted a higher mix of face-to-face. -face. They're coming to campus, they wanna live in our residence halls and they'd like um, to have a course load that had a little more face-to-face uh, -face or hybrid. And the other was a student who was fearful and growing more fearful and wanted to take her senior year that was three hybrid classes and two online 
and move more fully to an online but meet our requirements. So we're trying to, um, to create the conditions that allow people to flex because COVID responds to us each in a very personal way. We have a universal feeling of, I think, not enjoying the constraints. We have a politicalized, politicized environment around the constraints. But I think that its, it's impact on us, you know, uh, is very different, very individual based on the conditions that we live in, the conditions we work in, our family, our own health, our own wellness, our own tolerance uh, for living in a world that is going to have this virus with us for some time. Um, it's also hit us economically, and I want to take a moment to, to touch on that. You probably can see that from the conversation, your health and safety is our first priority, and we are resourcing what we need to do to secure a healthy and safe community environment. And um, in addition, we know that the economics in the state of Michigan are far more challenged than they were a year ago at this time and that our families are suffering. We know our students, um, we didn't need a pulse survey because students have um, expressed themselves through petitions, a petition that wants to see more engagement in our university experience and a petition that would like to see less cost on our university experience and objects to the tuition increase that we put on of 3%. As we try to balance all of those factors, what, was, what I want you to understand is our thinking is that individual experience of people that have lost their jobs, are dealing with illness, perhaps lost insurance coverage. We needed a greater capacity to respond and allow them to continue, whether that's online or face-to-face. -face. Um, and so we utilized the tuition increase to drive a 13% increase in student aid in order to support those students who are most hard hit. And we're trying to, to help people to understand our logic uh, around that action. Uh, we also are trying to help people to understand that we're all sharing in the responsibility to contain our costs and keep our, our, our tuition low. In fact, the 3% tuition increase, um, along with the reduction of online fee, was the lowest tuition increase since 2008 and significantly below our, our average uh, over those years. So we are trying to be mindful, but we do need to respond. We had 8,000 hardship requests. We do need to respond to those students. Again, this is irrespective of whether they're online or face-to-face -face, that um, do want to return and need help to do that. So I, I wanted to take this moment to share that with you and I wanted to take this moment to thank you because each and every one of you on here has given up something. You've given up your time um, because we're all doubling down on the work effort to make this happen, to dual plan the way the provost has indicated, to give up some of our significant focus for a period of a year and no more in order to commit to teaching as a first priority in this environment where we're resource constrained, to give up our, our raises, to give back in our student support funds, uh, to give up um, many of the things that we love. And we're trying to move that through this period quickly. But I'd like to turn back to Dr. Graham one more time because I think that the reality of moving through quickly and a vaccination and the process of that, to me, and I think um, to many of us um, underscores the reality that we've got to find ways to live with this. So Dr. Graham, I'd just like to conclude if you wouldn't mind with some of your thoughts. Sure, uh, thank you, President Mantella. Uh, as a, a virologist and an epidemiologist, my, my contribution here is actually uh, non-science based. Um, years from now when <laughs> movies are made and books are written about this pandemic, it'll, it'll all be with the benefit of, of 2020 hindsight, uh, a precious uh, commodity that, that we don't have right now. Uh, we're smack in the middle of this. In fact, we're probably not even at the middle. Um, it's, it's impossible to know with, uh, with any certainty whether the decisions that you know, we make in, in this moment, uh, history will judge to be, have been the correct ones. Um, 
there's no playbook for this. Um, the key thing I would emphasize here is how utterly fluid our collective situation is. You know, despite the, the best efforts of this small army of colleagues that have been working on this since March, February maybe, um, in, in good faith and in, in full transparency, relying on evidence-based best practices, dis despite all of that, uh, measures deemed prudent one day may have to be completely revised the very next day because conditions change. Um, I, I think that's gonna be inevitable. Uh, professionals on the front lines echo this. If we can somehow embrace this uncertainty, if we can manage expectations, I think we'll, it'll, that'll serve us well going forward. That's my two cents worth. Thank you, Dr. Green. I really appreciate it. And um, I think uh, we need to offer each other a lot of grace, a lot of gratitude, and a lot of support as we go through this period. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.